Hello everyone, we are going to begin a new chapter and this chapter is known as Laws of Motion. The first concept that we are going to try to understand is the concept of force. Now we have heard the force many times before and we use it in our daily lives usually to denote effort applied to complete a task. So we are going to try to see what is the intuitive concept of force. Now you may already know it but for closure and completion let's take a look at what force normally means. In the crudest and most simplest terms, force means a push or a pull. But what is this push or pull doing? Usually this push or pull is either changing or tending to change the state of rest or uniform motion of a body. So what I am trying to say is that in its simplest term, force is a push or a pull. And we know this because pushing someone on a swing requires effort and this is an example of force. Similarly. Pulling someone in a tug of war also requires effort which is an example of force again. So push or pull is the simplest way to understand what force is. Let's try to see what are the effects of force. There are in the broadest terms four effects of force. The first effect is when force causes an object to go from rest to motion. A very simple example of this is when you are playing football. The ball is initially at rest, you kick it and make it go into motion. So this is an example when the force causes an object to go from rest to motion. The other effect that is going from motion to rest is also very obvious. If you have playing cricket and the ball comes in your hand and you catch it, this is an example of a force that required you to catch the ball and make it go from motion to rest. The third effect that we are going to look at is that force can cause an object to change speed. Very simply speaking, if I am riding a bicycle and the force applied by my legs on the pedal on the cycle is changing speed. But again, it doesn't have to just be the force applied by you physically. It could be the force of an engine in a car which is changing the speed. But in general, I am trying to say that force can also cause a change in speed and that's the third effect. The final effect of force that we will study is that force can cause a change in direction. One simple example of this is if you are playing volleyball, you are going to hit the ball in a direction, preferably away from the opponent, but basically you are going to change its direction. So these are the four effects of force. After studying the effects, let's write down the formula. We all know that force is a product of mass and acceleration. In fact, this formula comes from Newton's laws and you may have learned it before, but we will review Newton's laws through the course of this chapter. For now, let's write down the formula and remember it that force is mass into acceleration. Look at the formula and see what is the unit of force. The unit of mass is kg. The unit of acceleration is meter per second square, something we learnt in motion in one dimension. And this makes the unit of force as kg meter per second square. This is the SI unit of force. Now let's also ask the question, what type of quantity is force? For this again, we look at the formula. We know mass is a scalar. Acceleration is a vector, which makes our quantity force also a vector. So we saw what is the unit of force, which is kg meter per second square in the SI system. And we also said that force is a vector quantity. Let's write down the formula in terms of symbols. F is equal to ma. F is a vector. A is a vector. So there are bars on top of them. Finally, we just saw that the units of force is kg meter per second square in the SI system and gram centimeter per second square in the CGI system correspondingly. But it is important to know that it is not these names that we call the units of force by. Usually, the unit of force in the SI system is known as Newton. This is simple and this is what you will generally use. And similarly, the unit of force in the CGS system is known as dyne. So, gram centimeter per second square is known as dyne. So, you have Newton and dyne as the units of force. Let's see what's the relationship between Newton and dyne. We just saw that 1 Newton is equal to 1 kg meter per second square. But I know that 1 kg is nothing but 1000 grams, that is 10 raised to 3 grams. And I also know that 1 meter is 100 centimeters, that is 10 raised to 2 centimeters. So I am going to substitute for these quantities and write 1 Newton as 1000 grams into 100 centimeters divided by second square. Now it's very obvious that 1 Newton will then become 10 raised to 5 gram centimeter per second square and we just saw that gram centimeter per second square means dyne. So I have 1 Newton equal to 10 raised to 5 dyne and this is the relationship between the SI and the CGS units of force. So we saw the formula for the SI system and the CGS system. Let's take a look at some other units of force. 
You also have gravitational units of force. And these are kgf or kilogram force and gf which is gram force. These units are usually used when you want to make a conversion from mass to weight. Now this is normally there because people confuse mass for weight. In simple words, if you have an object of mass 5 kgs, then the weight of that object would be 5 kgf. And remember that weight is a force, something people generally tend to forget. So these units, that is kilogram force and gram force, you will use when you want to make a convenient conversion between mass and weight. Let's define what is 1 kilogram force. The gravitational force acting on a body of 1 kg on the surface of the earth is said to be 1 kgf. Now what does this mean? This sounds very difficult. Very simply speaking, what is gravitational force acting on a body? It's nothing but the weight of the body. So instead of this complicated sentence, I can also say that simply speaking, the weight of a body of mass 1 kg is 1 kgf on earth. And this is because weight is a force. Remember, this is very important that weight is a force whereas mass is not. So whenever I'm talking about gravitational force acting on a body, I'm actually asking you what is the weight of the object. Finally, let's write down what are the dimensions of force. It's m1, l1, t raised to minus 2. So now we saw the intuitive concept of force. We wrote down its formula and we also saw its units. Let's now review what are the different types of forces. The broadest classification of the types of forces is contact and non-contact forces. Contact forces are those forces which you commonly see in mechanics. Let's review them really quickly. The first one that we all know and we just heard of is weight. What is weight by definition? It is the force experienced by a body of finite mass when placed on the surface of the earth. We just said it is nothing but the gravitational force acting on a body. Everything that has mass has weight. Something that has more mass has more weight. For everything from a bird to a cat to a car to a ship, all objects that have mass also have weight. The second type of contact force that we know of is the normal reaction. What is normal reaction? By definition, it is a reaction given by surfaces. Any body placed on a surface experiences a force perpendicular to the surface in contact and this force is known as the normal reaction or the reaction force. Let's take an example. It's a very good question to ask, why do objects placed on surfaces not fall down under the force of gravity? And the answer to that is obviously normal reaction. Let's say for example you have placed a bottle on a table. Even though this bottle is exerting a weight on the table downwards, it's not crashing through this table. And this is because the table or the surface is exerting an equal and opposite force on the bottle, which is nothing but the normal reaction. So we learnt that normal reaction is perpendicular to the surface as you can see in this diagram and it is exerted by surfaces. So finally, remember that normal reaction is exerted by surfaces and it is perpendicular to the surface, but very importantly, it is a reaction force. It is only exerted and in reaction to an exerted force and not exerted initially on its own. The third type of force that we will see is the tension force. Tension force is exerted by a rope or a string or a cable. When a force is applied on one end of a rope or a string, the force on the stretched end of the rope or string is called tension. Very simply speaking, elevator shafts are suspended using thick cables. These cables exert tension. It's the reason why the elevator can rise or descend. Now, tension always acts away from the body. As you can see in this diagram, the tension is acting upwards. So, tension always acts away from the body. Another simple example is when you have tug of war. One person pulling on this side is exerting force. And when you pull the string on one side, the person on the other side also experiences the force. So, force applied on one end of the string is experienced at the other end. And of course, always acts away from the body. As we just mentioned, that tension always acts away from the body. The next type of contact force is the spring force. We all know what is a spring. But the spring force is a resistive force. Why do I say resistive? Because it resists. But what exactly is it resisting? It's resisting a change in its length. A spring force is exerted whenever you try to change the length of a spring. So we all know what a spring is and how it works. If I try to stretch the spring, that is I try to move it away or increase its length, it's going to try to restore its length and therefore the force exerted by the spring will be inwards. In this case, I tried to stretch it down, so the force of the spring was upwards. 
Similarly, if I try to compress the spring, that means I have tried to shorten its length and therefore now it will try to exert a force in order to restore its length and therefore the spring force will be outwards. So whenever you compress a spring, the spring force is outwards. So always spring force acts in a direction opposite to that of displacement. You move it to the left, it tries to bring you back to the right. You move it to the right, it tries to bring you back to the left. It's always opposite to the direction of displacement. The formula for spring force is F is equal to minus Kx. In this case, Kx is the displacement, F is the force and K is the spring constant. Now let's look at what would be the unit of the spring constant. X is a displacement, it would be in meters. The force is in Newton and therefore the unit of the spring constant would be Newton per meter. These were the first four contact forces. The final contact force is that of upthrust. Now you must have heard of upthrust. Whenever any solid body is in contact with the fluid, there is an upward force exerted by the fluid on the solid. This force is known as upthrust or buoyant force. Simple example of this is any object floating in water or any other liquid. So let's look at this example where you have a ship floating on the sea. In the crudest of terms, I can explain this by saying that the weight of the ship is acting downwards and the force exerted by the water in this case is the upward force which is exerted by the sea and it's balancing the weight. But that doesn't mean that upthrust is only given by liquids. You could also have upthrust given by gases. Let's look at this hot air balloon. In this hot air balloon, the weight of the balloon and the people in it is acting downwards and the upthrust exerted by the air acts upwards and that's precisely what helps you to be floated in the air. So what have we learned? We learned that buoyant force is always exerted upwards but more importantly it can be exerted only by a fluid and a fluid means it could be a liquid or a gas. So these were the contact forces. Let's look at non-contact forces. These are something that you generally know and therefore let's review them really quickly. The first one is the gravitational force. We know gravitational force attracts all objects to the center of the earth but it is also responsible for keeping all astronomical objects like the galaxies and the solar systems in place. The second one is the electromagnetic force. So you can see electromagnetic forces in magnetism. You also see electromagnetic force for the proton-electron attraction inside an atom or the proton-proton repulsion inside the nucleus. The third type of non-contact force is the weak force which is responsible for radioactive decay and finally the nuclear force which keeps protons and neutrons inside the nucleus. We know that protons are all positively charged and therefore they experience electrostatic repulsion. But even then the protons stay in the nucleus due to this nuclear force. In fact, it binds all the nucleons, that is protons and neutrons together and this nuclear force is responsible for keeping them together in the nucleus. So these were all the types of contact and non-contact forces. If you like the video, please subscribe.